Okay, I'll try and keep this to time because I have where people have trains and planes and things to catch. Um, so I'm currently a research assistant at the University of York um, and my research is I think a lot different to the talks that have already come already because my uh, area is more in the archaeology of emotion um, and I have a feeling some people will be groaning, you know, yes I'm going to talk about my feelings today. <laughs> So I've been working on a survey over the last few months um, with a bunch of departments at the University of York. You know, we've got philosophy, um, health sciences and archaeology all doing a, a big survey together, looking at the importance of objects for people. And we did this survey a few months ago and we've, we've just closed it. Um, and we're just starting to crunch the data, but it's been really interesting looking at the kind of anecdotal data on a kind of very surface level. So we asked people to tell us about an object that was important to, uh, to them and kind of describe the object. And there were some really lovely stories in there. So we had someone who talked about some jewellery they'd been given by family and they said, I get some of the same comfort from wearing these two bracelets as I would from speaking to my parents or granddad. And someone also said about a ring that they got from their grandmother. It reminds me of my grandmother and also of my family. I think there's a particular comfort in feeling close to family even when they are far away or no longer here. Now this concept of emotional attachments to objects isn't one that most of us will find unusual. This is something that we're all fairly familiar with because it's a normal part of everyday life. However, there's no real archaeology of object attachment at the, at the moment and it's something that seems to be ignored by most archaeologists because I just don't think they're aware of the importance of it. So today I'm going to give you a very basic overview of what object attachment is and how it might be of use to archaeologists. So I'll give a very, very brief overview of the archaeology of emotion on a very, very basic surface level. I'll then go on to talk about the psychology of attachment, as well as its behavioural effects. And then I'll briefly talk about my research at the moment, which is beginning to understand an archaeology of attachment. You know, co cognitive archaeology is making some massive leaps forward, and it's been really interesting seeing some of the talks today. There's some really fascinating work going on, and I just kind of, I'm just here to kind of argue that we should be considering emotion as well. So current approaches to archaeology, um, are, uh, to emotion of archaeology, are a bit depressing, to be honest. Um, we're compared to other disciplines, we are very behind the curve. If you look at uh, disciplines like history and anthropology, in the last few years they've really developed their theory of emotion. Archaeology is very, we're still doing it in a very simplistic way. So a lot of archaeologists, when they study emotion, they tend to pick one individual emotion and try and pinpoint it in the archaeological record. And more often than not, they're looking at averse emotions. There is literally, if you, if you kind of believed an archaeologist's view of the world, you would think that we're all really, really negative people who've never experienced happiness ever. <laughs> and that's not very helpful. The problem as well is that we don't experience emotions one by one. They're very complicated and messy. And I think that's half the reason people don't want to study them. Now there has been some fantastic work linking emotion to materiality, which is really necessary because as archaeologists, that's what we're left with, stuff. For example, um, Sarah Tarlow's done some brilliant work kind of calling for people to study emotion. And more recently, um, Oliver Harris has done some fantastic work on the uh, link between emotion and identity and how that links to materiality. But overall, we're still missing a lot. And when I started doing my master's research, what, which is what this is based on today, um, I decided to, instead of look at archaeology, look at psychology instead. So I'm using a different approach, which is attachment theory. I think this is very much um, what Mark was saying earlier about a retrospective conditional approach, where you kind of take modern research and then go and look at it back in the context of the past. So we'll start by looking at the psychology of attachment. So attachment theory was sort of formulated in the 90s and 1960s and 70s and is really, really popular in psychology today. It started as a way of understanding um, the relationships between children and their caregivers. Um, and essentially attachment theory is very, very simple. And it says that we have this innate attachment behavioural system that is shared with all mammals. This attachment behavioural system leads us to seek out attachment figures who provide us with feelings of comfort and security. Now it does this in two ways. It provides uh, a safe haven, which is the idea um, that you're cared for, uh, that this feeling that you're cared for and the feeling of going 
having someone to go to for comfort. For example, um, in child psychology, children will run to an attachment figure like a parent or guardian if they're frightened. The second thing that these attachment figures provide is a secure base. And this is a little bit more complicated. This is the idea um, that we have the confidence to explore one's environment in the knowledge that the support is behind you. So studies have shown that children are much more explorative when they feel secure, when they have these attachment figures. Now, uh, in recent years, the kind of focus has moved on to um, object attachment because you know attachment figures come in a variety of forms. You've got, as a baby, you've got your sort of parents, then you've got your peers as you get older, and then your romantic um, sort of romantic partners. You know, these are all the different kinds of attachment figures we have. And in an ideal world, we would only need to rely on other people. But as some of you may know from first-hand experience, people aren't always helpful. They might not be there, or they might not be helpful. Or the things they might say not be very, might not be very supportive. In these kind of insecure situations, where we're in an insecure situation or an insecure person, the attachment system is extremely flexible, and so we can rely instead um, on non-humans. So a classic example is pets. Pets are often people's attachment figures, providing the same feeling of comfort, security, which is really vital for mental well-being. But it goes even further than that. We can become attached to inanimate objects. So the classic example is in the film Castaway. You know, if, if you've seen this, you'll recognise this image of Wilson, who provides Chuck, the main character, with an attachment figure, providing that comfort and security at what is a very insecure time in his life. Now, um, object attachment in childhood, there's been a kind of concept of it for uh, probably about 60 years, and a guy called Douglas Winnicott in 1953 came up with the term transitional objects. In this, he argued that particularly in Western cultures, um, during the weaning process, children are given objects, and they help them deal with insecurity. In this way, they act as proxy attachment figures. Now, obviously, I've got to say that there is a lot of cultural variation in this, but research seems to show that there is a universal capacity for object attachment. It's something that we can use when we need to, not that we always do. Now, weirdly, we've only actually realised that adults are attached to objects in the past sort of decade. It's not been studied before this. Um, and uh, American psychologist Lucas Kiefer is really leading the way, and I really urge you to read his papers because they are fascinating work on on um, object attachment among adults, looking at things as um, you know, like teddy bears, but also at things like our attachment to mobile phones and how that's become an emotional um, link as well. Kiefer theorises that objects are most useful in insecure situations, and that they act as mnemonic devices. In other words, they remind us of other people or other things. However, I go further than that. This, uh, there's this constant idea that attachment objects are just proxies. They're not real attachment figures. They're kind of just um, ke sort of keeping the keeping place for someone else. Actually, I think over time, attachment objects become important in and of themselves. We imbue them with emotion and feeling, and over time, we don't need those initial memories to get the emotional benefit. Now, the really interesting thing as archaeologists is the behavioural implications. You know, a lot of this idea of comfort and security may seem a bit wishy-washy and a bit airy-fairy, but it's really vital for our well-being. So one of the main ones is enhanced emotion regulation. Um, this idea that we're able to self-regulate more easily. So this leads us to be able to maintain a positive mood. It enhances our mental well-being, and actually, because it enhances our mental well-being, this has a knock-on effect on our physical well-being as well. There's um, secure individuals have a lower risk of all um, all-cause mortality. So basically, you're likely to live longer, you know, if you're feeling secure. You're more resilient, which is incredibly useful. I think people really underestimate the power of resilience for our survival. And it essentially allows us to adapt and overcome. Now, I did a, a pilot study during my master's in which I put people on purpose in a stressful situation. Um, I don't have much time to go into the detail of it now, but what, what essentially, and it was only a pilot, but it, it tentatively showed that having an object with you enhances your ability to deal with that feeling of stress. So it makes a real difference to your ability to move through stressful situations in life which is going to make you more adaptable. It also enhances your empathy. 
Um, so your ability to care about others is enhanced when you feel secure. <coughs> now I kind of think this is probably because when you're insecure, you're thinking about your own insecurity, you're thinking about yourself. When you're secure, you don't need to, so you can afford to think about other people. Not only can you think about other people, the quality of care that you give to others is a lot higher. And secure attachment is almost a bit contagious. It's been shown that if an insecure and a secure person are in a romantic relationship, over time the insecure person will become secure because of that consistent support. So if you're... Um, if, you're, uh, if you have secure attachment, you can kind of pass it on to other people. And it doesn't matter whether this secure attachment comes from other people or comes from an object, the effect is the same. We're more tolerant, um, both of those that we know and those that we don't know. It's, it's you know, a really massive effect. And in an archaeological standpoint, this is going to lead to more successful intergroup interactions. It's going to lead to groups that are more likely to work with one another, to trade and exchange. And in this context, actually, attachment objects might be better attachment figures than people because they're kind of portable and you can swap them. And it's kind of li uh, links to things like gift exchange and things, you know, creating social links with people even when they're far away because you've got that material reminder of them. And last of all, I've already kind of briefly spoken about this with the idea of the secure base, but there's also increased exploration. When we're secure, our curiosity is enhanced, we're more open to new experiences. Again, our resilience is enhanced. And we have enhanced problem-solving skills. People are more likely to take healthy risks. People are more likely to try new things and give, you know, give things a go. So security is really, really vital to our ability to move forward, both personally and as a group. But why is this useful for archaeologists? So I've, this is kind of where my research is kind of coming to. It, it's not as complete, I guess. Um, but the, the both both research in attachment in psychology and um, my own research suggests that when we look for attachment objects as archaeologists, there should be certain commonalities that we see. So one thing that we see is that there should be small portable objects. You can't, an attachment figure is really hard if it's really hard to lug around. You know, it's not going to be a giant statue. It's unlikely to be anyway, because it's not going to provide that kind of ad hoc support that, that we look for in attachment figures. They're often handled often. If you think about, if, you, if I don't know if any of you have a, a cuddly toy from when you were a child, when we care about something, we do tend to handle it quite a lot. And so the, when we look for attachment objects in the archaeological record, they're, they're likely to be quite worn. They're often representations of humans and animals. There seems to be, we seem to, I don't know whether it's because we seem to empathise with things a bit more when they, they kind of have a form that we understand a bit better, but that seems to be something that comes up commonly in the archaeological record. And they may not necessarily be special items. When we talk about emotion in the archaeological record, we tend to talk about sort of special items, like exciting things. But attachment objects are often very mundane, so they may not be the ones you're kind of expecting them to be. So I'm kind of encouraging you to sort of think about the mundanity, the kind of everyday objects that might have been emotionally important too. Now, there's going to be a lot of diversity, which will make things difficult, but at the same time, I think that kind of opens you up to different, um, you know, you, you, it's kind of a new area of study, and it, it could be anything. But at the same time, research suggests that we're likely to see cultural patterns as well, and I think this is probably where we're most likely, to, um, as archaeologists, to find useful information. It's by looking at cultural patterns of materiality and how these might relate to attachment. So I'm going to give a t couple of really, really brief examples. Um, so one is toys. So the archaeology of childhood at the moment is, is still a, <coughs> similar to attachment. It's a kind of new area of study. Archaeologists are kind of s just starting to understand uh, that, that children were important too. Um, and if, if we think earlier to what I said about transitional objects, children are the people most likely in the archaeological record to have these attachment objects. So when we're looking for them, you know, children are a great place to start. So, for example, um, I've, uh, I've got a paper that's coming out in March in which we talk about the, this figure on the left, which is a little figurine of a pig. So you can kind of see the nose there, got an ear here, and you've got four little stubby legs. Um, and this was found buried with a child at Stonehenge. Um, 
and child was very, very young, so it was likely that this was more of a t an attachment object for the parents than it was for the child. But this is the kind of thing we should be looking at. You know, when we look at um, material culture related to children in the archaeological record, people just say they're toys, or they say they were artifacts that helped them learn to act like adults. But I think we forget about the emotional aspect of it too, and the, the need that children have for that comfort and security. So I think this is one potential avenue. You know, understanding that child-related material culture are not just toys, but have real emotional significance. If you also look at things like art, this is another area that kind of doesn't fit your classic paleoeconomic interpretations of material culture. This is maybe one area. For example, if we look at Upper Paleolithic Venus figurines, these follow a cultural pattern. These are found all over Eurasia during the Upper Paleolithic. These absolutely beautiful models. And the kind of existing interpretations of them kind of just say, oh, it's just, it's just sexual, it's erotica, or, or it's something to do with fertility. And the problem with that is it kind of just it kind of just hammers in these existing Western interpretations and it thank you, um, and it kind of just assumes that people thought about sex in the same way that we did in the past. But actually if you look at these, they, you know, the, the amount of time spent on these and the intricacy of these objects suggests a real emotional <coughs> significance and importance. I think actually some of these may have been visual reminders of other people or other groups. If you look at um, uh, this one, for example, this is the Venus of Hall of Fells in um, Germany, and I always thought before I started studying that this was a head. It's actually not, it's a suspension loop. So this was hung on a pendant, uh, carried around someone's neck, and there's a lot of wear and polish on this, suggesting it was worn. It, you know, it's very small, but that it was worn quite a lot. This fits the characteristics of an attachment object. It's small and portable, you know, easily carried. And perhaps it was a representation of someone else, providing a comfort and security, even when that person was... Um, far away. This links to these ideas of gift giving that I talked um, earlier, people exchanging these items as reminders of one another. I think portable art in particular may be a really interesting area, you know, avenue for, for study in the future. So hopefully I've been able to give you a really quick understanding of what, um, what object attachment is and why it's important. You know, uh, as, as archaeologists, I think we struggle to deal with the, the notion of emotion because it can be seen as very wishy-washy and difficult to grasp. But luckily, it, it's really interesting, and I think an attachment perspective is just one way in which we can begin to understand the link between emotion and material culture. So when we see portable, worn objects in the archaeological record, we should consider their potential as attachment objects. Because when we understand object attachment, this helps us gain a better understanding of human emotions, behaviour and material culture. There's a tendency, I think, sometimes to treat humans in the past like they were robots, like they were completely unfeeling. And we have to remember that our emotions are an intense part of our daily lives, and that was exactly the same in the past as well. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, I'd like to thank Dr Penny Spikins at the University of York, as well as the Department of Archaeology, and the Archaeology Research Priming Fund um, for some of the money towards the survey. And I'll do a shameless plug. Um, the project I'm working on at the moment, we've got our own website. We've got some podcasts that are up if you want to listen to some of the stories that we've been talking about in those. Um, or feel free to get in touch with me through my Twitter or email. And thank you, Mark, for letting me speak today. <laughs>